welcome. Welcome to another episode of Taboo Talk featuring me, your very own pastor, Lady Charmaine Day. Today is the debut episode of Taboo Talk Podcast. And let me tell you what you can expect. You can expect subject matter experts in a lived experience sharing their stories and resources with you in the first half. Then in the second half, we'll talk about their pearls of wisdom and what they have learned and can share with you to help you have a better life. So let's get right to it. And I'll introduce our first speaker. Her name is Clara Kylie. She's the coordinator at NAMI New York City Metro, and she's in charge of programming. Help me help you by welcoming Clara. Thank you, Lady Charmaine. Thank you, Clara. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Clara. I am the Outreach Coordinator at NAMI NYC, the National Alliance on Mental Illness of New York City. So I'm going to say a couple words about NAMI NYC, and then I'm going to turn it over um, to, to the next speakers. So NAMI NYC is a grassroots mental health organization. We are based in Manhattan. Our office, although the office is temporarily closed, is in Manhattan. And, uh, but we serve all five boroughs of New York City. And now that we're uh, running all of our programs virtually, we're welcoming folks from all over the country and all over the world as well. So we offer support groups and classes free of charge for people dealing with mental health issues or for who are supporting somebody who's dealing with a mental health issue. So um, if you have somebody in your life that is struggling and you're struggling to help them, um, we offer support groups and classes to help you support those people in your lives. Um, we know that it uh, can be really difficult to, to support other people. And we also wanna make sure that um, everybody that's in that position of providing that really important support is also getting support for themselves. So that's kind of what we're about. You can find out more um, by going to our website at namiNYC.org or by going to our calendar where all of our support groups are listed and all the Zoom links are listed to join. You can go to namiNYC.org slash calendar. Or you can call our helpline, which is open 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Uh, right now, between Memorial Day and Labor Day, our Friday hours are 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, we answer emails and return voicemails and take calls during those hours. And you can contact us at 212-684-3264 or at helpline at namiNYC.org. The last thing I'll say is that all of our programs are peer-led, so it's all about people sharing their um, lived experience with each other, hearing from other people who have gone through something similar, um, and that's what we're, that's the kind of community space that we're trying to create, so I hope that you check us out. Uh, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over um, to our next speaker, uh, who will be Stephanie, I believe. Hi, thank you so much, Clara. My name is Stephanie Renee Colon. Renee with one E at the end. My dad wanted a boy instead of a girl. I am 62 years old. I just had a birthday yesterday. Yay! Uh, I have known my husband for 36 years. We have three beautiful adult children and five amazing grandchildren. I've attended Long Island University, Columbia Graduate Business School of Not-for-Profit not Management and Silverman School of Social Work. I've lived in Africa, the Caribbean, Central America, Europe, and throughout the United States. My hobbies are acting, singing, cooking, dancing, and swimming. I have a large pet turtle. His name is Michelangelo. And I have two community fish that we call one fish, two fish. Oh. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Sonia. Thank you, Stephanie, and happy birthday. <laughs> um, so my name's Sonia. Um, and no, this is not a real background. This is a virtual background. Um, but I am originally from Australia. I've lived in New York for uh 13 years in august uh, i absolutely love it here um 
one of the things I love about New Yorkers, they say what they think and they think what they say. And I really appreciate that. Uh, that's how I also am, but Australians aren't quite like that. So I think I'm much more appreciated here than I ever was uh, growing up in Australia. Um, I really enjoy the summertime. It's my favorite time of year. Uh, when I experienced my first winter in New York, I had no idea how cold it was going to get. And I realized very quickly that I've never owned a winter coat in my life. So it's freezing and I did not appreciate it at all. Um, so the summertime is great. I love being outdoors. If I could walk around with no shoes, then I would, but you can't. So there's that. Uh, I also have a background in broadcast television in Australia, which is uh, really, ex I found like a really exciting, but not very useful skill to have literally anywhere else other than working in television. Um, but it's kind of cool to, to be able to put a television network to air. Uh, and now I'm using that sort of those skills uh, here. Um, and I make my own videos and for a show that I do that was on Bronxnet and also YouTube called Funny Mental Lives. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, so today's presentation is broken up into three sections. It's what happened, what helps, and what's next. Uh, Stephanie will share her story, and then I'll share mine. And that's for the, I think Lady Charmaine already sort of explained this, and that's for the first half. And then the second half, Stephanie and I will share our thoughts of uh, our pearls of wisdom and hopefully have a discussion along the way. Uh, and I'm really excited about being here, and I look forward to it. So. I had it back over to Stephanie. Thank you, Sonia. What happened? I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. I'm a survivor of having a father who was an alcoholic and a sister who abused all types of illicit drugs. I had severe suicidal ideation in middle school where I attended in Riverdale, New York. I was traumatized by frequently being bullied and called the N-word. From middle school to high school, I was distraught as a full-time scholarship student at Martha Graham School of Contemporary Dance, as I was regularly ostracized as the only black girl in class. In my 20s, I spent two years surrounded by the ravages of war as I participated in the civil defense militia with the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. In 1992, I was in my early 30s, living in Florida with my three small children. We relocated to a homeless shelter due to the devastation of Hurricane Andrew. My husband and I were separated because of his addiction to crack cocaine and subsequently he was incarcerated. It was shortly after these events that I had my first breakdown. I was working as a therapeutic cultural arts coordinator in a community health clinic. One morning I couldn't get out of bed, bathe, brush my teeth, send my children to school, or have the courage to call out sick from work. Fortunately, I had a friend who accompanied me to the clinic where we worked to see the psychiatrist. I was ashamed and embarrassed about being a mental health provider seeking psychiatric services in front of the patients which I served. Six months after being diagnosed with bipolar disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder and anxiety, I discontinued using the psychotropic medication and therapy. At this time, I was dancing with a group called Inner Motion. We were all survivors of sexual child abuse. Dancing and my children were the only things that gave me a reason to live. In 1994, I left Florida and returned to New York. I was hospitalized twice. I was hypersexual with multiple partners. And when I had money, I would shop till I dropped. Once I ran out of the apartment with just a nightgown on to beat up a drug dealer who threatened my oldest son. 
Also, I stayed up three nights without sleeping to pass a state audit as a clinical supervisor. In short, I was out of control. I was on a downward spiraling roller coaster ride without a way out. Sonia? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so a bit about what happened to me. So I was uh, also born into an abusive environment. I'm the middle child of uh, three girls. Um, and for some reason or another, my father focused on me. Uh, I'm not really 100% sure why, because uh, that's a difficult discussion to have and it never, it's never happened. Uh, but my father was also um, a child of abuse and um, his way of dealing with it was to not deal with it, just to pretend it never happened, ignored it. And uh, he, that was what he thought was how you're supposed to deal. But you know, obviously it didn't work and then he passed it on to his own children. Um, and that's sort of how life began for me. So when I started school, my expectation when I would be around other kids was that they were going to do something cruel. Uh, I was going to get harmed in some way. So I would try to um, play with other kids, but I was, always had in my mind that people that I was terrified of being harmed. I didn't know that's what was happening when I was little, but I can see it when I look back. Um, and so consequently, I did not make friends uh, and I became uh, the kid that got bullied and I was bullied from when I started school all the way through to graduating from high school. And my way of dealing with it was to become a bit of an overachiever. I thought if I set goals and I achieved them, um, that that was my way of dealing with it. And that I was, um, that made me very strong and it made me feel good about myself. And it really worked and it was really great. Um, and I thought when I graduated from high school that I was now an adult and that I was gonna leave all that behind in my childhood and I was never gonna be bullied or harmed again. And it was just this great feeling. Uh, and I thought the only problem I had was learning how to make friends. So I decided to go to university and study performance because I thought, well, that's where all the other social outcasts and weirdos go. You know, maybe they're my peoples and I'll make friends and I'll, I'll fix all the problems that I have. Um, but for three years, I was not bullied, so that was good. Um, and that was probably the best three years of my life so far. Uh, I learned a lot about myself uh, and it was great. Um, when I graduated from, from university, I then decided to work in television. Uh, and I don't know if anyone out there has worked in television before, in broadcast television, but it's like being in high school all over again. And I found myself being bullied again, except now I'm an adult. It was supposed to have been left behind me a decade ago. Um, and I apparently had no way of dealing with it anymore now than I did back then and cracks really started to begin to form. And I started, you know, trying to be an overachiever again, but it just wasn't working this time around. And uh, it took a while, but I think in my early to mid thirties is when I started to really have to pay attention and see that things were not going well. Um, because I, when I came to New York, um, as much as it was a great move and a new beginning, Five years after I arrived, I ended up on the roof of a building um, trying to will myself. Uh, and uh, that's kind of a little bit about what happened to me. Uh, Stephanie. What helps? The stigma of the mental health system stopped me from taking ownership of my overall mental health. I'm a wounded healer. And now I have the right team of mental health providers. I like to call them my dream team. That continues to help me on my recovery trajectory. What helps is that I'm ecstatic that I'm able to tell my narrative as a co-presenter today with you, with NAMI in our own voice. Also, I'm a co-facilitator for a NAMI support group called Black Minds Matter. I sing in the choir and lecture at my church. I'm so proud to be an active member of my jobs, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging committee. 
What helps is that I have been a peer specialist for the last 16 years. Presently, I'm working as a full-time peer specialist with a program which guides young people who are struggling with the challenges of living with a mental health diagnosis on the path of recovery and mental wellness. Moreover, I feel love and satisfaction from being an advocate for my son who is living and thriving with schizophrenia. It helps that I have been by my son's side when mental health providers didn't have a clue about what his diagnosis as a teen was. I had to be there for him as he suffered with catatonia in his early 30s. Now, he's a full-time father and student at Bronx Community College. My son makes me so joyful that he has been able to endure so much. I'm thankful I was able to advocate for him when I could not do so for myself. Sonia? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, what helps me? Um, so when I originally started to realize that things were, there was an actual real problem um, and I had to acknowledge and accept it, the first thing I had to do was uh, take responsibility for what was going on and what was wrong. Um, I started to realize that, you know, looking at my family and saying, you know, you are the ones who started this, that's not helping me at all anymore, that's actually hurting me. Uh, and so I started to look at myself and go, well, you know what, I'm the one who's doing it to myself now and I'm doing a way better job than I ever did. I don't even know I'm doing it. That's how good I am at it. And I had to, you know, start thinking about these things and start being really brutally honest with myself. And at first I was... I was like, what am I doing? This is horrible. But uh, uh, over time, I started to realize that what I was doing by taking responsibility of being the one who's harming myself, that means I'm in charge of that. If I can take care of that and be in charge of that, then I can also take care of and be in charge of helping myself. And that's kind of where I was going with that. That took uh, a long time to do that, though. It was not, not easy uh, and it was unpleasant, um, but it came... You know, the ultimate result of it was a really helpful, very useful one. Um, also, my goal was not to become kind of the opposite of what I was. I wanted to find where I really belong. So I started to uh, break myself down and look at myself as the me I was born as and the me I was forced to be through, through being abused and bullied. Uh, and those two people were very different people, and I didn't discard the one I was, you know, taught out to become. I learned to understand that person and love that person. Uh, and those were really the fundamental things that I had to do, because if I couldn't do any of those, then nothing else was going to matter. Um, and, yeah, and I ended up, um, it's what felt like a very long and arduous journey, which it was, and at times... Quite honestly, the hardest part of it was boring and tedious, uh, and that was problematic for me. Um, but ultimately, uh, I found myself in a place where being okay every day, as much as one can be, uh, is the best place for me to be. I don't need to be great, because that's, to me, as difficult as being you know, depressed. Uh, it's a very narrow world to live in. So I've discovered that the whole part in the middle where all my emotions live and where all my life lives is where I live and thrive. So uh, that's sort of a bit about me and how I sort of came to be. Um, Stephanie. <laughs> so last but not least, what's next? First, I would like to acknowledge that dance, music, and theater saved my life from complete destruction. I'm glad that I was a choreographer, instructor, and performer with national dance companies in Costa Rica, Cuba, Kenya, Nicaragua, and New York. You can see me on YouTube playing the angry vagina in a theater production of Vagina Monologues. What's next? creating a one-woman show, no doubt. 
Today, I have recommitted my time and energy to advocating to end the stigma of mental illness. I wanna be a champion for racial equity in my community and my place of employment. I have a renewed belief in my capability to nurture my relationship with my husband, children, grandchildren, and friends. I would like to leave you with a quote from Pat Deegan, an internationally renowned mental health advocate. And she says, courage in recovery means putting one foot in front of the other, even if we are afraid. Over time, those trembling steps add up to the life we want for ourselves. Sonia? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, what's next and also what's now? Um, I am, uh, promised myself when I was a little kid if I was going to go through all this stuff that it was going to have to have something other than that, what it, what it produced. And I want to make it more than that. So I started writing a book in 2015 and discovered that that's not easy for me to do. Uh, and it's you know, taken a while for me to find my voice, but I've, I've finally got there. So that's really exciting. Uh, and just the act of writing it and achieving that alone makes me feel really good. So when it's done, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be fantastic. Um, and I also was talking about earlier, talking earlier about um, that I was producing my own show uh, called Monumental Lives, which has also been a lot of fun. And I, I stopped doing it, I think, I can't remember, but I was going to restart it in 2020. I even I bought stuff and prepared for it and everything. And then, well, we all know what happened in 2020, so I couldn't do that. Um, but it's basically a, a show where people such as ourselves have a conversation about what we've been through. And it can just be a conversation. It doesn't have to be anything major or scary or being heavy. It can just be a conversation. And that's kind of my main goal about all of this, about speaking your own voice, you know, writing, making short videos and stuff like that is to just make, you know, talking about our mental health as simple as, hi, how are you? And you actually say how you are. And it's just fine to do that. It's just a normal part of everyday conversation. Um, so, yeah. And I also, you know what? I, I like myself these days, which is something I work very hard to achieve. And, and it's good. Right? And that's probably the best thing I've done so far in life. Um, so that's what I've been up to and what's next for me. So I believe we are now going to share our goals of wisdom. Thank you, Sonia. Very good job, Stephanie and Sonia. Thank you so much for sharing your stories. I learned so much about you and how you guys have overcome such tragic and trauma to do such great things with your lives. It's incredible. Let me give you a round of applause. Yay! Great job. So now we're into part two. And what's going to happen is each of the speakers that you heard today are going to share with you pearls of wisdom that they have learned to help them have good mental health so that you can have good mental health and perhaps avoid some of the things that they had to go through. So we'll start off with Clara, then Stephanie, then Sonia, and then I'll end it up. Okay, Clara, are you ready? Absolutely. Um, so uh, a couple of, of things that I can share that I think um, will hopefully, uh, hopefully be helpful. Um, so one is uh, definitely about the importance of boundaries. Um, I definitely have had to learn um, that uh, I, I can only control myself. I'm only in charge of myself. And sometimes that means that I, I know what's best for me. And, and sometimes that means I have to say no to other people and I have to, and there's a, um, a lot of anxiety that can come with that because there's a lot of fear of disappointing people or letting people down. Um, and, uh, and so one thing that I've definitely, um, that, that I want to share is just sort of the, the importance of, um, of, of setting boundaries around my own time and my own energy to say, you know, I can't, can't be everything. I can't be everything to everyone. 
Um, I have to just be enough for myself and start there. Um, another thing, uh, and kind of going along with that, the sort of part two of that um, is that uh, you know, when I start to feel resentful and angry and, you know, if I start to feel some of those negative things, um, often that means that I have to set those boundaries. I have to, that I have, that I've been putting out too much and I need to say, okay, you know, it's, it's my job to do this. It's not anybody else's job to not ask things of me or to know where my limits are. I have to say where those limits are. Um, so, so those are two things. Uh, yeah, Lady Charmaine, did you want to Yeah, I had a question to that. For those people who don't know what boundaries are, can you define that for us? Sure. So, you know, a boundary just means, you know, um, it is, can just be anything where, where I say no. Mm. Um, you know, where, where I say, you know, no, I, I can't do that. Or, um, I, you know, I can't do that at that time, or, you know, I would like it this way and not that way. Um, and it can be something that, I, that I've definitely learned is that it can start small, you know, it can say, you know, it can be as small as, you know, if you're, you know, um, um, ordering something at a, at a cafe, you know, saying, oh, no, I want it this way. And I don't want my bagel toasted, actually. Thank you. Um, <laughs> if they, you know, ask you if, if you, if you want that. Um, uh, and, but yeah, just any, anything where you're, you know, saying, saying no um, to, to somebody's question um, or, or um, ask. Thank you. Love that was you. very helpful. Yeah, Sonia. Oh, I, I, I'm imagine. Are you finished, Clara? I was going to ask Clara something. Oh, go ahead, Sonia. Uh, so I, I imagine that sometimes that can be quite difficult because, as you said, you don't want to disappoint people. So can you sort of talk about how you got from being afraid of disappointing to being able to then set your boundary? Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, how how I got to that point? Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, I mean, it definitely it was it was baby steps, um, and I and I actually like I you know I know that that like toasted bagel um, example sounds uh, is is kind of silly, but but it's actually like can be a can be a genuinely a really good place to start because right like the person who's asking you if you want your bagel bagel toasted, they're not telling you like you must have your bagel toasted. They're asking you. They're saying you know do you want this or do you not, and so it's. Um, and, and I think it's easy, I know it would have been easy for me at one point to say like, oh, well, they're asking me, so I have to do it. Um, but just sort of changing that to say, you know, no, they're, they're not, it's not other people's questions and expectations are not commands and nothing bad is gonna happen to me if I say, you know, actually, no, thank you. Um, so, so practicing um, in those kind of very low stakes situations, um, was was how I I think how I learned how to do it to say you know if, if a friend said you know um, uh, and and this is a little bit higher stakes but you know it's still maybe not quite as as intense but if a friend says you know oh can we get together you know on this day say well actually I can't that day but what about this other day um, just really kind of starting with those small things um, and actually something that I've heard. Um, as a, as a strategy, like if that feels too, um, even that feels kind of too daunting is to actually practice saying yes to things, um, to, to really say, you know, yes, I do want my bagel toasted or, you know, yes, I do. You know, I would, um, I, I would, I'd like a small please, um, really kind of being and, and kind of practice asserting preferences in a positive way instead of a negative way. Um, sometimes that can be a good place to start as well, but it's just about practice. Um, so I think that's probably three pearls of wisdom there, <laughs> um, but I can, I, can, uh, so I can go on unless there are questions. Just like, so just starting with small achievable goals that may seem insignificant, but they're really good building blocks to get to the bigger ones. Absolutely. 100% agree with you on that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, 
So another thing that, that I can share um, is, uh, and this one's a little bit, a little bit trickier to sort of uh, phrase, but um, just sort of, uh, so something that, um, again, I, I heard that um, I found was really true to, to my experience was like, it can be really helpful to notice um, what makes me start to talk to myself in a mean way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I if I start to like talk to myself and I'm, and I'm suddenly I'm starting to, you know, be like, oh, like, don't do that, that's stupid, you know, that whatever. Like when I start to talk to myself that way, noticing what, cause it's not necessary, right? Like I don't, there's no need for that. There's no need for me to be mean to myself. There's no need for me to talk to myself that way. So what is it that kind of, um, that, that brings that on. Um, that's, that's something that, um, just get noticing when, when I start to be mean to myself and what is it that makes that feel necessary, um, is, is something else that I can sort of share. Um, and, uh, and the last thing, the last thing that I would say, um, is, uh, yeah, just sort of, I mean, Sonia sort of touched on it, but the importance of sort of um, being, uh, learning to sort of um, settle, to, to not necessarily be in the extremes, right? To say, you know, it's, it's okay to sort of be neutral. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what that feels like in my body, um, I think. Uh, my, my therapist has uh, done, a, we've done a lot of work on like, what's called somatics, which is basically just like bodily experiences and what different emotions feel like in your body um, and noticing that and paying attention to that and seeing how it like changes over time. Um, and that's been, that's been really helpful. So that's something that I would recommend to, to everybody. Excellent. Clara, those were some beautiful pearls that were really helpful. Thank you very much for sharing. Thank you. You're welcome. And now next we're going to hear from Stephanie. All right. Thank you all. I would like to start off with do what you are passionate about. Yes. Very important. Uh, I know for myself, I plan to uh, return to graduate school and do a master's in social justice and community organizing. Mm. And it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. I'm not worried what other people think, but it's something that I want to do and be beneficial for me and those that I'm involved with. That's excellent. Then give and love and get support. Very important not to be afraid to love yourself because through loving yourself, you're able to love others. And through that whole process of reciprocal, mutually reciprocal relationship, you can get the support you need to go further in your recovery. Stephanie, mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. If I don't love or like myself, how do I even begin to do that? That's a good question. Baby steps. Mm -hmm. I had mentioned at the end of my what's next that even if you shake and quiver and stumble, that you need to be able to develop in time the self-confidence that you are enough, that you're special, that you're loving, and you are you deserve to be loved and to find love. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Then, sure. Then my third one, it's not original, but uh, I love the saying, don't sweat the small stuff. <laughs> Too many times we get overwhelmed by the small things that happen, the small obstacles that come in our life, which we really shouldn't sweat and be bothered by. Question. 
Yes. Do you think that's a big issue going on right now with the pandemic and people living with each other for such a long time in close quarters? The people are sweating the small stuff. Oh, definitely. Um, I say that there's a double pandemic going on now. Um, the COVID-19, along with the racial divide that's been mm. uh, coming up on a regular basis in our country. Right. And those are big issues. So with that, if you realize that there's big issues that uh, we have to address, it makes us more conscious of the smaller things that we shouldn't let overwhelm us. Mm. Excellent. Thank you. Then the other pearl I'd like to share is take risk, but don't be risky. <laughs> <laughs> Don't behave in a risky way. Um, you know, take a chance on, you know, I'm, at my age, taking a chance to go back to school is taking a risk. But being risky would be trying to do 10,000 things at the same time go to school. It would just affect my emotional, physical, and mental um, in a bad way. Mm -hmm. And lastly, stay in the moment. Mm. And that's pretty oh. much self-explanatory. Oh, th yes, no, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. No, it's not. It's hard. Okay. Moment. Especially now, people are like, I want to think about the future, forget mm -hmm. about now. Well, it's a challenge. You're absolutely right. It's not easy to do, but if you remind yourself to stay in the here and now, it gives you more room to grow and mm -hmm. look at the future. Excellent. Thank you. Well, Sonia? Can I be just a second? I move on, let me just say, Stephanie, thank you so much for sharing those pearls. They were very helpful and very useful. Thank you. You're welcome. I was going to actually ask Stephanie something. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want me to do mine now? You want to ask a question or do something? Well, I was going to ask Stephanie, can it be, to stay present for you, can it be just as simple as reminding yourself and having that dialogue that says, just stay, just be present, stay present? That, does that work for you just being that simple or is it a bit Oh, hard? absolutely. You know, I, I agree with what Clara was saying that, you know, self-talk is an exceptional tool to have in your toolkit in regards to self-care and positive self-talk in particular. Uh, and then I feel that it helps me to stay in the moment when I'm able to remind myself that that's the best way to go about my life. Okay, thank you. Sonia? Okay, um, so for me, uh, I spoke a little bit earlier about um, sort of separating the me I was born as, as opposed to the me that I, well, I say forced to me because I think a lot of the things I learned from a very young age, were forced on me uh, by the people around me. Um, so I, I had to really start separating those two versions of me because I did feel like I was two separate people for most of my life. Um, and it wasn't to get rid of this, you know, all these negative and damaging things that I'd learned. Uh, it was to learn, try to understand them, I, just to know the difference between those two versions and then to try to understand both of those versions and also then to look at some of the damaging things and see if I could actually turn them into something that's actually going to help me as opposed to harm me. Uh, there were things that I had to get rid of that were no good, but I wanted to really nurture that little girl who, who got damaged and broken. I wanted to nurture her and 
you know, take care of her and then kind of put her to rest. That was kind of the goal. Um, and I learned along the way that, um, you know, to do that changing perspective on how I saw my past was very useful. And perspective doesn't have to be this 180. It doesn't have to be the opposite of what it was. Uh, it can be a very slight change. And to put it into the physical terms, it can be as simple as looking from left to right. You know, that's a whole different perspective and it's a simple little movement. Um, if you're standing there looking at a monument and you look at it standing up, sit down, it's going to look different. You know, this, it can just be that simple uh, to, to change my perspective. And once I sort of worked that out, it became a lot easier for me to see things a little bit differently. Um, and to help with that, I started with simple things also, like Clara was talking about, where because um, I thought I had no control over, you know, my my mind for a long time. I thought I had no control over how I thought and behaved. Um, and when I was very deeply depressed, I would lie in bed for very long periods of time and found it difficult to get out of bed even just to be in the bathroom. Uh, and to help myself with that, I started to realize things like. Now, while I'm lying in bed, I would scratch myself because I would be itchy. And I started to think about that and pay attention to that and realize that, you know, my hand doesn't just move by itself. My mind has to tell my hand to move. Uh, and that means that I have control over my hand. And it might seem like nothing because we move out everything all the time, all day. But it is something. And it gave me this little, you know, enough of a seed of, you know, oh, I have got control over myself, at least in a small way, um, that I got to start to build on that uh, over time. And it just gave me just a simple way to start, a very easy way to sort of build on that. Um, because one of the things I've learned is starting at the big end of things, that's way too big for me. Uh, I have to find a much earlier uh, stage of the process uh, to focus on and to sort of work on that. Uh, another skill that was very handy was, uh, so life is random um, and I would be triggered without even realizing it. And I would, as soon as I was triggered, I would immediately disappear into my head and off I'd go into that spiral, uh, into that negative thinking. Uh, and that's, I have no chance to, to do anything about it. So I then started to try, try to work out what led to that, if there were things that led to that, because it might have seemed random, but there, I'm, I knew that there must be signs leading up to that. And I, as I really started to pay attention to it, uh, I noticed that there were things that started sooner. Uh, and it, for me, it became every single time, it, it was just this moment where I felt uncomfortable or uneasy. It was just a second of that feeling and that's the very beginning of when I would start down that path because it was just a slow start yes Sonia question yes. is somebody trying to do what you're talking about how tell give me step one step two okay well for me it was such a major overhaul uh to to sort of I had to really uh, change myself. I actually had to take myself out of functioning in society because I wasn't functioning in society and I had to take my mental health on as a full-time job. Um, and the first thing, the very first thing I did was um, because the negative self-talk was the biggest problem that I had, I basically started this other thought process that was uh, like a drill sergeant and I would yell commands at myself in my head once I started on that diatribe. And I would just basically tell myself to shut up in no uncertain terms. That was the only way at the time that I had to just stop it. I didn't know how to make it better. I didn't know how to not do it, you know, any of that. I just knew that once I heard it, I just yelled at it until I shut it down. Um, That's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> That's the best thing I could do. It start that negative self talk came from force, mm -hmm. and so I used force to just stop it. Excellent. Yeah, that was Thank my you. beginning. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's 
so for me, the skills that I have where I can do right where I stand, you know, no appointments, no other people, uh, just me, myself and I right where I stand. Uh, those are the skills that I have that are the best skills. Um, and they can, they literally include when I start to drift, it's like touching, funny, you know, doing this to myself, reminding myself where I am. Yeah, it's something very simple. Well, thank you, Sonia. Those were excellent. Thank you. <laughs> I learned a lot about what I can do and the fact that I have control. And I like the idea of the forceful person speaking to that man, the man or woman in my head that's like, you can do this, you can't. Shut up. Yeah, basically. Like <laughs> yeah, that, you got it. <laughs> I got it. Told you. Yeah, that's like, basically it. Except I was more colorful about it than that. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Sonia? Um, I, uh, I, I, it's sort of a question, uh, but also just a, a comment, I guess. Can I, can I add that? Mm -hmm. So, um, something that I've heard, uh, people use is, um, you know, uh, sort of realizing, and, and I think it sort of goes back to what you mentioned about um, realizing that you were the one who was doing some of this to yourself. And um, can you, can you, and, and one way that I've heard people uh, sort of realize that is, you know, um, like I, I, I heard of someone who, you know, um, they're in like a, a group uh, a support group and, and the leader of the support group said, you know, if you were trying to make yourself as miserable as possible, what would you do? And they started listing off like, oh, well, I would, you know, I wouldn't sleep enough and I wouldn't eat. And I would, you know, um, surround myself with people that, you know, uh, were mean to me and, you know, I would do all of these things. And then, you know, and slowly people started realizing like, oh, that's like what I'm, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and and reframing it as like a oh this is something that my brain is telling me to do in order to be mean to me like this is this is sort of like it and and framing it that way made it easier to sort of like stop some of that like self destructive um, kind of behavior so can you talk like what about how um, how you were able to like come to that realization of like this is actually something that is hurting me. And it's also something I can choose to stop doing. Um, so the things of my you know, dialogue was just a repeat of what I had been told. So I was constantly told that I was worthless and that everyone hated me and I was stupid and ugly and you know, all this sort of stuff. And it went from, being told that by other people to then me telling it to myself. And I don't really know when that changed because there still was, like, thankfully for me, there was still a part of my brain that was like, none of this is true. Um, but that part of my brain was very quiet. The part that was saying all those things was very loud. Um, and at some point it became very dangerous. And that's when I, it took that for me to realize, oh no, this is bad this is dangerous uh and so i had to then try to focus on the part that's like going the the, the color it became very colorful you know this is a load of crap this you know these horrible things it's like you don't own this this was given to you it was never yours in the first place um and it needed to shut up it's like you know if you think about it you know a jackhammer out in front of you house at six o'clock in the morning you don't politely ask you, you just want it to and you, you know you yell at it and it's easy because that's obviously what you would do so I kind of thought of things like that and went well this is kind of like that it's a loud noise in my head it doesn't belong there and so that's why I would start to yell at it and all that sort of stuff but yeah and that, unfortunately it took for things to get very bad before I realized that it was time to I wish I could have worked it out sooner, but not the case, unfortunately. But you know what? I got there eventually. So. All right. Well, can I get your final thoughts 
because we're coming quickly to the end of the show. Can I get each of your final thoughts on what we covered today and how that can help people watching have a better mental health? Who would like to go first? I, oh, yeah, go ahead. Stephanie, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to tell everybody that, yes, it's important where you've been and where you are now, but focus on the possibilities of your future. Because all of those experiences, where have you come from, where you are now, is the combination that you need to have a future of recovery and mental health wellness. Excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and I think, uh, I think one thing I, I, that I feel like touches on a lot of things um, is just the idea that um, you're in charge of meeting your own needs and you're capable of meeting your own needs. Mm, excellent. Sonia? Um, one important thing I learned along the way was uh, one of the obstacles I had originally was that I was afraid of who I would become if I was no longer this person. Mm. Um, and one of those fears was, would I be boring if I wasn't this? Um, that's not the case. Um, but what I learned is that I didn't become a whole new person. I just became a slightly different version of who I already was. Um, and all those, you know, the damage, all that stuff doesn't go away or didn't go away for me. Um, it just got quieter and I was able to then bring out the parts of me that are much more healthy and caring towards myself. Um, yeah, so I just learned that I'm just a slightly different version of myself. So that was important. Excellent. And can you all please share how people can reach you, your URLs, your social media, whatever you feel comfortable sharing? I'll start with you, Clara. Sure. So um, anyone who's interested in finding out more about NAMI NYC, you can reach me at uh, ckylie at namiNYC.org. That is C-K-I-E-L-Y at namiNYC.org. Okay, Stephanie, you're mute. I don't have a direct social media contact, but if people are really interested in being in contact with me, I can give you my email, which is srcolone610 at gmail.com. Thank you, Stephanie and Sonia. Um, you can find me on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, which is Sonia Dawn, uh, Funny Mental Lives, and you'll just see videos of us, people having conversations about our mental health, and it's actually a lot of fun, so, uh, and hope I get to make more in the future. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Ladies, thank you. All of you have been so phenomenal, so helpful. I learned a lot, and I know everyone watching has learned a lot as well. Thank you. Let me give you a round of applause. Great job. Excellent. Okay. So this show was done because the CDC has said that a lot of people are suffering from poor mental health during the pandemic. And I wanted to bring on as my first show, subject matter experts who can help you have peace of mind, good mental health and learn how to get yourself together. And they did that. They showed up, they gave good wisdom, they shared themselves, their own story, nobody's perfect. They showed how they overcome their own trials and tribulations so that they could be healthy mentally too. And you can too. Just implement some of the advice that you heard today, the pearls of wisdom, and you will have a, a beautiful life. Taboo Talk Podcast. This is the format, story, wisdom. From now on, please tune in next week. We'll have Eric Weaver on doing the same thing. Well, I want to thank you for watching the entire show. 
it was helpful to me. I hope it was helpful to you. If you found it helpful, please support the ministry and buy my set of three autograph books at my store. These books tell my testimony. These two books tell my testimony. And this book is just my book of wisdom and, and pearls. And they sell for a set of three for $50. And this will keep the ministry going, paying for advertising, paying for the website, paying for the app. So thank you for your contribution. Well, until next time, take care of yourself, stay special, and remember you are a precious child of God and you deserve only the best. Goodbye. Thank you.